John 10. We did read some out of John 10 last week as well. Of course, we've been working through salvation and we've been breaking this down over the course of the last several months even to see how God works in salvation. That God is, of course, the author of salvation. He is the one who designed it. He is the one who orchestrates it. He is the beginning, the middle, and the end of salvation. And we spent months before that working through the fact that if we don't understand who God is, if we don't understand who God shows Himself to be, both in His Scripture and also by His nature, particularly in His Scripture though, if we don't understand who God is, then we don't understand salvation. And if we don't have a right view of God, then we can't understand a clear and right picture of salvation and how God works in the beginning and the middle and the end of salvation. So last week we went through assurance of salvation, what it looks like in a a person who is relying upon Christ completely, having put their trust in Christ, having been born again, what that looks like. And this week I want to uh, continue this about salvation, but look at the Christian doctrine of perseverance. The Christian doctrine of perseverance. Christian perseverance, again, just like the entirety of salvation itself, We only understand perseverance rightly if we understand God rightly. If we understand His character. How much God hates sin. How much God has designed and orchestrated this world in such a way as to work in the lineage of Jesus Christ. All the way from the beginning, back in Genesis 3, from Adam and Eve. It was actually before that. We'll see that in Ephesians 1 later. But really, He is purposing... His plan, and He reveals that somewhat in Genesis 3. And we know again that this is before the foundation of the world. But I want us to see that those who are in Christ will persevere to the end. We will stay in Christ until we either die or Christ comes back. For the record, Christians should be for the latter. Not just to not experience death and find dying. That happens today. We're good. We want Christ to come back. We want Christ to come back in His full glory. But, if He delays another hour, then we'll spend time working through perseverance. If He delays another thousand years, then we will spend time honoring and glorifying Him in the time that we have. So perseverance... Before we really look at biblical perseverance, I want to kind of crush early on a few bad views before we even read John 10. Because I think these are clear in John 10 why these are bad things. So we have kind of the extremes, I think, of what perseverance looks like. Um, You have our cultural perseverance, what we think about perseverance in our, I'll say Baptistic, non-denominational, even a few other denominations that kind of follow this principle of perseverance. And it's really a principle that isn't really reliant on perseverance or on God's work. It's more on relying upon what man has done. And the promise goes like this. Well, if you have made any confession or profession of faith, that equals that you're a Christian. And if you are a Christian, it's kind of an A, B plus, A plus B equals C kind of thing. If you profess in any way you're a Christian, then you are a Christian. So A and B. And if those things are added together, then equal C, you will definitely go to heaven. And you will not lose any salvation between the beginning of that profession with your mouth and you will go to heaven when you die or if Christ comes back. And that's... We, we talk a lot and we kind of criticize, and rightly so, an idea of what's called easy believism. Okay, with this idea that you just say it and you're a Christian. Or even, even in some circles, maybe Catholic circles or Episcopalian circles or even in other circles that maybe they believe in something like, well, when a child is baptized, well, then they're, now they're going to be added into the kingdom. Or when an adult is baptized, you just got to do it the right way, right? Go to the right church. So um, you can have a kind of a church of Christ for you. If you just get baptized, then you're part of the kingdom. 
And they think that anybody who has made this profession will, again, be secured until the end. And this is what's called, essentially what's called, antinomianism. I know it's a big $2 word, uh, antinomianism. If you're keeping notes, children, I'll get with you later to spell that one. Antinomianism. All it means is this idea that if we're in Christ, if we've really been saved, or if we're, you know, made this profession, then we can really do whatever we want to do. We can live any way we want, and we'll still go to heaven. Because really, we're saved, and we're part of the kingdom, or whatever, and we're fine. That's kind of one extreme. So you live whatever the way you want to, whatever way you want to, and still be in Christ. There's another, and some of these things overlap, by the way. The other extreme, of course, is that you can lose your salvation at any moment. So Church of Christ, even charismatics have this idea often that you can be in the kingdom and then out of the kingdom and then in the kingdom and then out of the kingdom, and that could change with the turning of the wind, right? The wind could blow in a different direction, and you could be in the kingdom and out. Uh, because of maybe your own, you know, you fall into some kind of sin. Of course, it might happen to ha- have, an, have to happen one afternoon or one evening or whatever. It just goes from one thing to another. And there's no, there's no surety in it. There's no firmness in salvation. It's, it's almost up in the air. And you can lose it as easy as you gained it. And so I've known people, charismatics particularly, who have said, well, I'm in church right now, which means I'm going to heaven. And then I'm out of church later, which means I'm not going to heaven. And if I get caught in the wrong time, then I'm doomed. And both of those things are not biblical. They're not something that we see in Scripture. And we want to be biblical, not reactionary. One of the things that people have done, the Charismatics, and I think the Church of Christ, and even others who would claim you would lose your salvation, especially when they preach that in the 21st century, they're preaching it against the antinomianism of just live whatever way you want. Many people that I've met will say, well, hold on, all you people over there in your churches that say that you can have salvation and you'll never lose it, all your people live like heathens. And if they're looking at the church at large, I'd say, well, that's right, you're right. And that the conclusion often is that, well, that's just, that's just how it works, and then their works are kind of hidden under their, the dirt of their exterior and the sinfulness of their exterior lives. But we've already walked through what salvation looks like. You must be born again, right? You must be made anew. And that's a regenerating work of the Spirit that only God can do. And it will be dramatically different for the person, for the individual coming to Christ, than they were before they became a believer. It will be. You will go from death to life, from darkness to light. You will go from a dead in trespasses to alive in Christ. And anything that we talk about when it comes to perseverance will not happen in any way, shape, or form unless someone has been born again. So they can say they're a Christian, right? We see that in Matthew 7, that many people will come to the Lord Jesus Christ on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do all these things in your name? These are people who are affiliated with the Lord, by the way. People who have proclaimed in one way or the other that they are connected to the Lord. There will no doubt be many people, maybe millions of people. I hope that's not the case, but I'm fearful it is. That there will be millions of people on the day of judgment that will look to God and say, look, I did all these things. I said the prayer, or I got dunked in the water, or I gave to the church. I even told people I was a Christian. I put it on my profile. I know, I know I'm in heaven. I'm supposed to go to heaven. So we don't want to be reactionary to the world like some of these people say. I'm going to throw that out because all these people don't live like Christians. You're right. We want to preach that they be born again, that they are actually made new. So before we ever get to perseverance... We've walked through these other things already about salvation itself. Perseverance only comes for believers, for those who've been born again. John chapter 10, if you would read with me, Jesus makes it very clear whose are His and whose are outside of the kingdom. He says in verse 1, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Now this kind of paints a little bit of a picture of the the person who is saying, Lord, Lord, do we not do these things? But you did not go the right way. 
You've not really repented and believed the gospel. But he, verse 2, who enters by the door of the sheep, is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead, ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my Father. A division occurred, this is verse 19, again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, He is a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus says in verse 25, I told you, and you do not believe. You do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Let's pray. Father, help us as we read your word today. God, help us to understand what your scriptures preach. And Lord, I ask that your scriptures would preach to our souls. That we would not take these these passages of scripture that we read or the truths therein. God, do not let us take these things lightly. Do not let us simply just say, well, I know I have this. It's okay. I'll just move on. But Lord, let us apply these things to our lives. Let us believe the truths in scripture. God, draw us near in Christ through Your Word and through Your Spirit working through Your Word. God, it, is, it, it would be easy for us to just think that we know about these things and to move on. But God, please, let us slow down. Let us listen to what You have to say in Your Word. And Father, I ask that Your Spirit would change us by the ministry of the Word itself. In the name of Christ, Amen. So we've given a few bad examples of perseverance, uh, of what perseverance is not. And I want to give maybe a biblical definition for what perseverance is. I I know we use a phrase in a lot of Baptist churches. What's the phrase that we use? You know what it is. Once saved, always saved. We're once saved, and it sounds really catchy. It sounds like something you would definitely put on the back of a t-shirt or something. Uh, And that's, it's, it's it's kind of become so so watered down that it has no value. Because I mentioned earlier, because so many people just claim the name of Christ, they've reached out, they've grabbed it by their hand, the, the claim, that is, 
but never really embraced Christ. Never really repented and believed the gospel. So the, this idea of once saved, always saved just has no weight to it. It's empty. I think one of the things that Christians should do is try to use language that's first biblical, which once saved, always saved is biblical. Um, once you're saved, you are always, always will be saved. You really are being saved as well. It's a continuation of God working through us. But that's also clear uh, and pointed. And I think sometimes we use phrases that sound good because they're easy to circulate, right? They're easy to go from one generation to another. And so we just attach ourselves to easy phrases. And once saved, always saved is an incredibly easy phrase to remember. I remember in school, I got to ask somebody what the Trinity is, and very few people could not just explain it, because obviously that might be difficult for a lot of us, but to even say anything of what the Trinity is. Maybe even a word like sanctification. What is sanctification? Nobody would know what that means. Regeneration, no idea. What does it mean to be born again? No clue. None of those things really resonated with a typical, in my case, Southern Baptist kid who'd been to church his whole life. But if somebody said, hey, how do you know you're a Christian? Are you going to die and go to hell? Like, no, man, one saved, always saved. I got that phrase wrapped up, right? It's on a t-shirt. I've tattooed it on my ankle or something. It's somewhere. I got it. Here it is. This is the phrase. I know that no matter how drunk I get on the weekend, no matter how many of the girls I sleep with, I have that phrase. That means nothing, right? It has no value now in our culture because it's not pointed and because we use it to, uh, we will use it ad nauseum, right? And I think it's important for us to use phrases that are Christian phrases, of course, biblical phrases, but that have weight to them. So we use words like perseverance. We use words like the preservation of God's work. And that's why when we read things, often it's, um, we're using a confession of faith, for instance, that's from 1689. Nobody uses that language anymore. Right? Hardly any of us do. And, and so it's sometimes helpful to kind of get out of just commonality of everyday speech. That's why you don't really have a lot of textbooks for college students, for the most part, written in the common everyday vernacular. Now, it is in the everyday vernacular, but it's obviously more educational. So they're not just saying, you know, simplistic language. They're using heavy language at times. And that is oftentimes helpful for us. So I want to read the definition. This is from the Bible. So this is not a definition that we are just making up. This is a definition being compiled of through the scriptures. And this is the definition actually from our confession of faith. It says this is what perseverance is. Christian perseverance. It says those whom God hath accepted in the beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit. Again, these are things that we've already worked through. Sanctified by his spirit and giving a pression precious faith of his elect unto can neither totally nor finally fall from the state of grace but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved they persevere to the end and are eternally saved so perseverance is it's the lord jesus christ preserving you to the end of your life until either you die or or Christ Jesus comes back. Now, just for clarification's sake, perseverance is not necessarily a long life. Thief on the cross. He was a very late in life convert. Very late in life, right? On his deathbed, well, so to speak. On his death cross, on his death torture device. So perseverance does not mean long life. It does not mean successful life. It does not mean healthy life. It does not mean easy life. It does not mean a life that gives exactly what your flesh wants and not what God wants of you. And I think sometimes when we think about God and His character, we think, even though we don't say it often, I think we act as though God will give me this many years of my life. I'll live to this age. I'll have my family here, my career in this way. Everything will work out. And we'll put it in its little compartment and it'll all work out because that's what I want. That's what everybody else seems to have around me. And so that's what I will have with with being a Christian. But God owes you nothing. God owes you nothing. Do you hear that? God does not promise that you'll live an extra day. 
He doesn't need to give you promises like that. He owes you nothing. He could kill you today. And God would be still perfectly kind. Perfectly loving. And by the way, God does those things, right? I know we, we oftentimes, we act like death is, is kind of a byproduct of life. And it is in a way. But God is the master of those things. He's not shocked when you were killed. He's not surprised when you get sick. He's the master. He's over those things. And I think because the wages of sin is death, that it's God's justice when you die. It's God's justice falling upon you when you die. So in a way, even though we are redeemed in Christ, even though our souls and then later a resurrected body will live eternally in the kingdom with Christ, we're going to die on this earth unless Christ comes back, right? We will die a physical death. And God does not owe you a long life. He does not owe you happiness. He does not owe you happiness in, in world's terminology. He does not owe you any of these things, comforts or anything like that. And I think we live as though God would just give us what we want. And this perseverance has a, a human effect to it in, in a sense of a, a physical effect that it will kind of carry over into the physical world. And that is not necessarily the case. We could die as soon as we are converted. And I think, I'm sure, in the realm of 2,000 years of Christian history, there have been perhaps many that were on the cross next to Christ, in a way. Right? On their deathbed, or on a battlefield, and knew that they needed to repent and believe the gospel. I don't know if many, I don't know if I would say many, I'm sure many people have tried to do that. Oh, let me just wrap it up real quick. You know, kind of like Catholics do, as somebody's dying, they read them their last rites. Not from Scripture, but read them something and maybe that will help them as they ease their passage into eternity. But I think there will be men in heaven, not just the thief on the cross, but others who the Lord was merciful to. And right at the end of life, God saved them. Or right what they perceived to be maybe not the end of their life, maybe it was the middle of their life, maybe it was the beginning of their life. And the Lord saved them only to kill them the next day. The Lord can do that. And we cannot expect that His perseverance means that it will be done so in a physical way. Again, He owes us nothing. Also, perseverance, of course, is not earned. You did nothing to earn salvation, so you therefore do nothing to earn a long, persevering life in Christ. Even if your life is not long, but short. You do nothing to keep your salvation. Only Christ can do this. You're never going to be holy enough or good enough or have good enough theology or good enough morality to live a life for Christ in which He would say, well, I'll then, now that I see your life, now I'll preserve you to the end. That's not the way it works. That's not, of course, how salvation works. And so that's certainly not how perseverance works. Perseverance is, always, or is also... Um, not you, and one of the things that, um, that we see in other denominations or, or in other people's faith, they would suggest that, well, you look at, look at a passage like John 10, and Jesus says, no one will snatch these sheep from my Father's hand. I've heard that mentioned before in, in light of, well, no one can snatch you from God's hand, but you can jump out and run away. Now, just in practicality, that just seems kind of absurd that, someone would actually make that reference, right? That, that inference, I guess, from the passage. That Jesus has us firmly in the hand of the Father because He is the great shepherd. And you can't be snatched out by the devil or some other form of wickedness. But you can hop out and run away. That obviously seems illogical, but perseverance is not suggesting that God is trapping you there necessarily. Many people would say that, well, you can run away from the faith. I'm going to read a passage out of 1 John or a verse out of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. John makes this distinction here in verse 19. And he's talking about some that will leave, that will seemingly leave the faith. And this is what John does to answer that problem. When we would see somebody who seems like they have left the faith, right? They have lived a life 
And their morality, I've already mentioned how morality doesn't keep someone in Christ. Or a holiness doesn't keep us in Christ. Or a right theology doesn't keep us in Christ. Well, then what about the person who seems to run away from the faith? Well, this is what John says about this. In verse 18 of John, 1 John chapter 2, he says, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared, multiple already. From this we know that this is the last hour. He goes on to say in verse 19, They went out from us. In other words, there are people that are part of our churches that left our group. They went out from us. They, they abandoned the faith is what he's saying, essentially. And he says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not, that they, are, that they all are not of us. Part of this uh, cultural Christianity that we see that is so muddying the waters of of what we said in the Christian life, so to speak, would suggest that there are many that are doing this exact same thing that John is saying can't happen. That a Christian would leave the fold, hop out of the hand of God, and go run amok in the world and leave. You leave the fold, right? Um, and, and run away and be lost for eternity. John says, actually, if you have people that are part of your group, and I don't mean this simply just in a church setting, because you have people leave your church. That, that doesn't mean they're necessarily unconverted, of course. But he said, that if there are people that leave, that go the way of the world, then in a way that's a benefit, because you can then see that they were never really of you. They were never really part. And we mentioned when walking through the gospel, we know that none of us know the souls of the other persons in this room, do we? We don't know what your soul looks like. We can certainly judge by your fruit, but you've probably known of people that lived an incredibly moral life, an incredibly religious life, and then it seemed like they just fell off the deep end into immorality and into rejecting God. I've known people like that that lived a life for a time incredibly in an incredible righteous way go to church really religious and all the things that they said and did even had really good theology and then at a moment fell away a good example of this in pop culture now pop christian culture is a guy named josh harris he's probably the easiest example remember josh harris yeah you've read the books jared no he wrote the book he wrote that book called uh, i kiss dating goodbye so if you were my age uh man every girl in college read that book and every guy wanted to punch Josh Harris because he wrote this book telling all these girls you need to stop dating these guys and all these guys were like well how are we going to get married you know of course and he wrote several other books he actually wrote a book on um, the church it was actually really good but he lived this life he lived this life seemingly part he was a pastor of a church he lived this life seemingly part of the fold he looked like a Christian Nobody would ever question this guy was preaching at conferences. He's writing Christian books. He seemed like a Christian. And all the things on the outside would suggest that he was living for Christ. But then he fell away. And now he doesn't believe in God at all or has some kind of weird, crazy view of God or whatever it is. He fell away. And what John is saying here is when people do that, it's not because they were in Christ. They have just kind of wandered away a little bit. They left to show that they were really not part of us. And I think there's this picture in the Christian or in the, in the, in the Bible itself and in the Christian life, in the church, I guess, that if a person claims to be in Christ um, and they try to genuinely take it seriously, but they don't know the gospel or they, don't, they haven't really yielded to Christ, maybe. They take religion seriously or something like that. Well, then in this world, it is easy for them to, of course, fall away. It's easy for them to fall in love with other things. But they are not really in Christ. So we, we, we mentioned a little bit of what perseverance is. Gave you a definition. We see passages like John 10 that speak of God holding us in his hand. We mentioned what perseverance is not. But I want to, to kind of give us a, a surety of what Christian perseverance is and what it looks like. Uh, for the Christian and, and how our hope rests in this truth. 
perseverance or the fact that Christians persevere to the end or sustain to the end of life is tied intrinsically to God's character. It's based on God's character. God is incredibly faithful. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul tells the Corinthians, of which he is about to write about all their sinful issues that they have to repent of. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, God is faithful through whom you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. We've spent months working through the character of God. And if we, again, this goes back to having a right view of God. If you have a right and clear picture of God and you understand who God is, you know that God is faithful. He is faithful to His own. He is faithful to those who are His. He is faithful to never leave and never forsake. Because that's who God is. He is faithful. A few weeks ago, we covered adoption and what it looks like to be adopted into the family. And as we, as we walk through that, of course, if you see the Scriptures, you see that it's not simply just a name change. But you have been turned into a different person. And you are taken out of your family, the family of darkness, and been added to the family of the King of the universe. This is not a small thing. This is not a small thing. You are now part of the family of God. And He, God, would never abandon His own children. Because He is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. So it's completely... We could talk about God's faithfulness. We could talk about His care and His love and His compassion. But about all these characteristics of God, perseverance is based on God's character. That's, that's the foundation. The Gospel itself, all these things hinge on who God is. So if you don't get God, then you, again, you don't get the Gospel from beginning to the end. You don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. You don't understand God's character. But perseverance is also part of God's plan. And this again goes back to His character. Because He has this plan from eternity past to save sinners. This is of course in Ephesians chapter 1. In a few weeks we'll go on, we'll we'll break down more of Ephesians 1 and passages like it. um, Looking at God's um, ordaining hand and electing and saving sinners, right? Through his, um, through his electing grace and His foreknowledge. But this is what Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1 says. Now again, if we are in Christ, tell me that as you're listening to this, Paul is preaching to us that our perseverance is, is kind of shaky. I don't think so. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul does something here that any editor or any book company would tell you not to do. It's like he starts out in the very deepest end of There's like, hey, how's it going? Here's the deepest theology I can possibly give you in Ephesians 1. Sink or swim. But this is one of the most, this is the, the, one of the deepest passages of Scripture, of course. What he says in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Think about what he's saying. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. These are really deep words. They're not shallow words or phrases. He's not saying, ah, you're saved, you're good, we're good. This is not a Sunday school lesson. The old type of Sunday school lessons that we think of, just, hey, God loves you, you're going to be kept, it's no big deal. He says, no. He says, no, he's giving you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, verse 4, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us before him, or in him, before the foundation of the world? Now, just think about it, just from a, a reasonable, logical perspective. Does God choose us in Him before the foundation of the world only to unchoose us later? That clearly doesn't make sense. That's foolish. But He does. He chooses us. He chooses us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. 
In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Again, there's that word again, adoption. We're predestined to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Through Christ, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, you're predestined through Christ. This is a plan. And if there's anybody's plans that can't be thwarted, it would be God. Amen. Right? There's no, there's no option. I know we're jumping ahead to the election stuff, but we're going to get to that. It's going to kind of cover all of this. Right? So that's why we're doing it at the end. It's going to kind of go back and kind of cover all these things. But God is, God is promising here. Before the foundation of the world, before Adam and Eve even sinned in the garden. Think about that. It's incredible. Adam and Eve is in sin the garden. I'll have a plan that I'm going to redeem this chosen people. I'm going to do that. And he's going to do it in love, he says. In love, he predestined us as adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. Again, just as a, a, a constant application here. Which trespasses? We read this in our catechism the other day. It's, it's not, well, in our statement of faith. Which trespasses? Just some trespasses? The ones you did right before you came to Christ? Or the ones that you did, are doing, and will do? All of them, right? Not just some of the trespasses. All of the trespasses. Forgiveness of all trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the time, of the times. That is the summing up, of, uh, summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things in, on the earth. In Him, just in case we're not clear, Paul continues... In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His own or his, of His will. We have been predestined according to His purpose, and He works all these things after the counsel of His own will. To the end, verse 12, that we who are the first to hope in Christ will be to the praise of of his glory we'll actually come back and finish that section in a little bit but for now think about what he said it's part of God's plan God chose you before the foundation of the world knowing how wicked and sinful you would be he chose you and we spent a lot of time breaking down the fact that that is not because of something you did it's not because of your works none of your works not you being smarter than other people to choose Christ or holy or righteous, but because of His own grace and mercy. That's what makes God's grace, by the way, so incredible. Because it's actually grace. It has no basis in merit. It is completely unmerited. That's the definition of grace. Unmerited favor. It is actually unmerited. He chose you before the foundation of the world. So election, and I want this to be clear for us because for most of us, this reform doctrine stuff, like we're, we're, I, I think part of us when we were first learning it, if you didn't hate it, you probably thought it was kind of cool or something and it, it kind of pulled you in a little bit. But it's not a niche thing, okay? It's not a niche theology or a niche doctrine. This is life. It's a promise. It's a promise in Christ that we are preserved because of God's never-ending hold and plan and purpose for His people. So all these things, is, they're based on God's character. They're based on God's character and on God's plan. Now how does He work this perseverance through? We've actually already kind of covered a lot of that in Ephesians chapter 1. He does choose us before the foundation of the world. We're elected in Christ before the foundation of the world. But he doesn't just say, I'm going to do something. He, he also does it, right? He doesn't just promise it. Even if it takes 2,000 years 
or 6,000 years. I mean, think about it. He chose you, and it would take 6,000 years of our time before God would bring it to completion. And if he delays another 5,000 years, he will save other Christians and other Christians who are predestined before the foundation of the world. That's incredible. He is so incredibly patient to work out his plan and his purposes. So incredibly patient to do so. But what does he do? How does he actually complete this? Well, first he does so, of course, by making us new creatures in Christ. So back in John chapter 3, we know we've read this multiple times lately, especially walking through salvation, that Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again. The whole part about new birth is that it's a new birth. That it's a new life in Christ. You were once dead and now are alive. So He makes you a new creature. He doesn't just start kind of a work in you. Or again, change your label. That's not what it is. I think oftentimes the way we apply the Christian, the, the Scriptures, and I think we, the way we apply the Christian life in our culture is that it's only a label. It's really whatever you want it to be. You just slap a label on it. And that's not Christianity. Christianity is God radically saving sinners, making them into new creatures. All right, Corinthians 5, 17, new creations. So He makes us into new people, born again, death to life. He works that perseverance in making us new. So suggesting that we would lose that would be us being made alive in Christ only to die and go back into darkness. Doesn't even make any kind of sense, and it certainly seems outside of God's character that He would start this work. I mean, think about it. God started a work in Genesis 3 and and completed that work, not really all of it, but the, the part about Christ redeeming sinners, thousands of years later. You don't think God is long suffering or patient? He literally dealt with all the stupidity and foolishness and and wickedness of the Israelites, knowing that one day he would send Christ, the Messiah. He is incredibly patient. But with us, no patience. That's what we would be suggesting if we would suggest that we lose salvation. That's the God of the Bible. God, of course, when he causes us to be born again in John 3, in the early parts of John 3, what does he do kind of in the middle of John 3? He, he makes this promise, promise that if you are in Christ, that Christ Jesus, what? He saves you to what? Eternal life. What's the passage or the verse that we all know, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but what? Have eternal life. He, he's giving you eternal life. And what is He saying? Actually, that's not really eternal life. Is that what He's saying? Is that what he's saying? I'm going to give you eternal life and then I'm going to take it away. <clears throat> Sounds like eternal life is eternal life. And of course, when he says you sh- you're not going to perish, he doesn't mean you're not going to die because physically we know we will die. Jesus actually clarifies that continually in the book of John. We're going to die. But what does he say about Lazarus? We're really only going to sleep. We're really only going to sleep. If you remember that story, the apostles were kind of misunderstanding these things. Jesus says, it's okay, they come tell Jesus, Lazarus is dying. He says, alright, no big deal. He's only asleep, is what he says. Then a few verses later, the apostles are like, Jesus, we've got to hurry up, Lazarus is dead. Or he's, he's asleep. Like you said, he's only asleep, so we've got to get there. And Jesus says, he's not asleep, he's dead. And what does he mean? Is Jesus contradicting himself? No, he's like, that, that, that's what I meant, he's dead. But to me, I'm God, I can bring back anyone from the dead. And the apostles, of course, they don't really get that until they show up. And then Lazarus is all stinking in the grave and and then they roll the stone away and hold their nose and Jesus calls out to Lazarus. He calls out to a corpse. He calls out to a corpse and he brings him into life. So Jesus is, he's the author of these things. He's the master of these things. We know that we can die a physical death. But we will have eternal life. I mentioned this before. I don't think the opposite of eternal life is just death, by the way. We say, well, you don't have eternal life. Everybody has an eternity. But I think there's the difference in eternal life or eternal death. 
Because I think hell is, in, in part, an eternity of dying, but never dying. Does that make sense? An eternity of that, but never actually completing it. So we'll all live eternally. But what God promises and what Christ is promising us is that those who are born again will live forever. Eternal life with God. Forever. That's a promise. He doesn't, as he says in Revelation, write our names down in the book of life. In the Lamb's book of life. Their name has been written down for all eternity. And then he says, I just imagine that, right? Just imagine what kind of eraser it would take to erase our names out of the book of life. Out of the book of God's Lamb's book of life. Christ's own book that has His saints in it. Just imagine. And that seems like something Satan would do, right? Would walk up and say, I'll borrow the book. I'll erase the names. Because that would be a lie that Satan would tell us. We're not really in Christ. He doesn't really love you that much. You don't have a mediator with Jesus your sins are still on you. That's what guilt is often. It could absolutely turn into your sins are still there, man. You've, you've not really been born again. But Christ says, no, they're mine. They're mine. We're also, of course, as we mentioned earlier, we're adopted. If you would turn back with me to Ephesians 1. We're, we're not... So we've we've walked through the things of being elected before the foundation of the world. And God has ordered these things to to happen. um, That He would save us. But in that, He said, and we mentioned this, we read this earlier actually, about being adopted. He says we're going to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. That was back in verse 5 of Ephesians 1. Now let's go down to where we left off at in verse 13. So, we're adopted, we're brought into the family of God. Just imagine what kind of father God would be to bring in a child off the streets only to later put them back on the streets. He wouldn't do that. He says in verse 13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. So you've been born again, you're, you're now in Christ. He says what? It says you were sealed in him by or in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. He saves us. He seals us in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are we have been branded now with the seal of the Holy Spirit. God. In spirit now. Can we lose that? Can we lose this? No, I don't, I don't think we can. I don't think we can. He says, not only were you sealed again with the Holy Spirit of promise. Break the seal of the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't know what the argument of the Church of Christ or the Charismatics are. I guess you were sealed, but then unsealed, or he's not going to not seal you, but you break the own seal like it's a jar of pickles or something. Like that's not the seal, right? This is a stamp. This is a, a soul bearing stamp of Christ. You are his now, not anyone else's. No one else's in the world do you belong to. Not to Satan, not to yourself, not to the world. You are Christ's. You are his. You are his. And this seal bears witness to that fact. And we've been given the Holy Spirit a promise as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. So He works in these ways through us and in us. The last thing I'll look at before we close is back to John 10. Back to John 10. So in John 10... We read verses 1 through 18 before we really get into the part about the fact that we'll never perish inside the the hand of the Father. But all the things from John 1 through John, or verse 1 of John 10 through verse 18 speaks of the great shepherd, right? That 
the sheep know his voice and he calls them by name and he goes and he gets them and brings them back into his fold. And then we see in verse 25 when Jesus answered and said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify me. All these things preach about who I am as the Messiah. Verse 26, but you don't believe me. You do not believe me because you are not my sheep. Who believe? The sheep. We are born again. We are changed into new creatures. But there's really only two types in this world in, in terms of sheep and goats. You don't see in Scripture the goat turning into a sheep. Because of what we read in Ephesians 1, they're already sheep. They're lost and astray, right? Gone. But Christ goes and brings them back. He goes and brings them back. And He says to those people, to the Pharisees and all these people, He says, you don't believe this because you're not my sheep. You don't believe because you're not one of mine. He says one of mine though, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them. Eternal life. And they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We have the promise of Christ. And then he kind of doubles down on his own commitment, right? He doesn't just say, it's okay, I'm just Jesus, I'm the flesh guy, I'm the flesh here, Emmanuel. But no, he says, just to be clear, this is the Father as well. I give them eternal life, they will never perish, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And of course he says, I and the Father are one. And this is really, when we get to Ephesians 1, it kind of pulls it all together, right? That the Trinity, by its very nature, is so, God is so intrinsically active in every single part of salvation. Every single part. Every single part. So as Christ lays down His life for the sheep, it is the Spirit who seals us in Christ Jesus for eternity. There's nothing that can remove us from them. Because He does not leave. He does not forsake. He does not abandon. He does not do that. That's outside of His very character or nature to do. It's like the question of God, could God lift a rock that was, or make a rock that's too big for Him to lift? God can't do things outside of His nature. He can't lose one of His own. That's outside of His nature. It's not possible for you to lose your salvation, not because of you, but because it's not possible for God to lose Amen. one of His own. It's not possible for God to have an adopted child, one who's been added into the kingdom, a son or a daughter of the king, to be removed. It's not possible for your name to be written down in the Lamb's book of life and be scratched out or erased. It's not. It's not. And it is based upon God and His character. Brothers and sisters, as we've been walking through these different aspects of salvation, we do not work through these things where we leave here and we pat ourselves on the back and say, man, look at what I've done. Because it's not about what you've done. Because you've done nothing. You've been a part of it because God went and grabbed you and pulled you into His family. So if if you hear this and you you see these things in Scripture and you're under this delusion that this is about you, repent. Repent of that and come to Christ. Because we have eternal life in Christ. Not one day, not a thousand days. We have eternity in Christ. Rest in in Him. Rest in Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You that You are God and there is no other. Thank You, God, that You are kind to save sinners, that You add us into Your family, that You have placed the seal of the Spirit upon us, God, that we are not We're not in the kingdom and out of the kingdom and in the kingdom and out of the kingdom, Lord. 
But we have been bought and paid for by the price of Christ's blood. And not one drop will be spilt. Not one drop will be wasted. Remind us of the power of your spirit. The power of the blood of Jesus to completely atone for sins. It's not a small thing, Lord. Let us preach these truths to ourselves, God. Let us believe that. And as we sing now as a, as a body, Lord, let us sing it with all of our heart, the truths of who you are and how you have saved. In the name of Christ, amen.